I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and this week we're in the kitchen at a vineyard. It's in Baser, Kansas, Holyfield Vineyard and Winery, and I'm with the vintners, Michelle Meyer and Les Meyer. So we think of vineyards, we think of Sonoma, Italy, France, not so much Baser, Kansas. <laughs> How did this happen, this beautiful vineyard in Baser? Well, it happened because my dad wanted to make wine from grapes that he grew. Ah, a good beginning. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So in 1986, he ordered 400 grapevines, and we planted them. Where did you order them from? Foster's, a foster nursery in uh, New York. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so in most of the hybrid rootstock that we plant in the Midwest comes from nurseries back east. Okay. And we don't grow in this region. We can't grow vinifera, Chardonnay, Cabernet, Merlot, Sauv Blanc. We can't really grow those. They're not cold hardy enough for our climate. So we don't have a long enough season for that. that that's, uh, that's exactly right. Now sometimes they'll, they'll grow, but we don't have a long enough maturing time. All right, so we grow the kind that would survive and thrive in Kansas. Yeah, correct. Started out with 400 vines. How and many today? Oh, like 15 acres, and we don't know Lots. the number. <laughs> Lots. <laughs> That's a good description. When you say, Dad? Well, I would say more five, 13,000. There you go. Like if you had to have a number. If you had to have a number, 13,000 mm -hmm. vines at least from what was 400. Mm -hmm. Started out to be you just wanted to make your own wine, and now it's your your business as well as a passion. Well, that's correct. It, and when they were started, it, Michelle hadn't been interested because I, you know, a vineyard and a winery is a long-term thing, and you got to have somebody that's young. Uh, if I was 30 years younger than Boss Frank's age, but you might then, have taken this on well, your own. Well, and then when we started, there was nobody else around planting grapes. I imagine not. You adapted it to the the hybrid and to our environment here in Kansas. And later on, when we go into the vineyard, we're going to see exactly what you're talking about. But you adjusted them so that they would produce well here. Well, yeah, and how they liked it, how they liked it, how they were happy with it, okay. the way they were growing. So how did you make the leap from, it's when Michelle got interested in this that you knew you had a future as a winery? Well, no. <laughs> well, there was something else in well, the well, Yeah, that we sold grapes. And then we, uh, Michelle likes to say, Dad likes to dig holes and we gotta put something in it. That's, that's pretty you had much. to do something with all the holes your dad had dug. Every year he'd want to dig more holes and we'd plant more grapes. And so, you know, it for us, we were more evolved from starting out with 400 grapevines to having 14 acres. Um, we didn't sit down one day and go, we're going to plant a 14 acre vineyard. We slowly, you know, added to it over time. And, you know, dad had a business in Kansas City and I was working in Kansas City. Um, but then it got to the point because it takes three years before you get to pick grapes. So eventually our uh, grape production was exceeding what we could legally make as home winemakers. So that's when we decided to create the winery as a market for our own fruit and have a value added product in wine from our vineyard. And how long ago was that? That was 1994. So that's when you made the decision to open the winery. To open the winery. Right. So it was it was, you know, a span of time. We slowly came to that point where we decided to do that. And when you made that decision, what was your vision for the kind of wine you were going to make, the sort of vineyard you wanted to own and operate? Well, <laughs> I think what we would say about ourselves is that um because well, we evolved. Yeah, we did. You evolved along with your vineyard. Right, and and honestly, you know, Dad has a farming background, but that's, uh, you know, and I have a marketing background. We don't either one of us. That's a good combination for a vineyard, though. That's true. <laughs> we didn't study viticulture. We didn't study enology, but um, the key to successful winemaking is successful grape growing, and so that's why we spend so much time in the vineyard. Is it? It shows in the wine, yes. and that is really the 
the most important aspect of things. And for us, um, our vision really was just that we wanted to make a quality product from something that we grew. And so it's all an estate product and you know, our handprints are on every single grapevine, every single bottle, every, you know, pretty much everything that's Holyfield has to do with that vineyard. And what you, and what you do. And right. I and think we won't, we, we have really high quality standards. We're not, we're not making it just to make it. We, we only want to make a premium product. And that's what our goal has always been. So your marketing background, your farming background, but both of you with the same work ethic of if it comes from here, it's been cared for by right. us every step of the way. Exactly. And when we go to out to the vineyard, we're going to take a look at some of those grapes and how you care for them. I think right. one of the things that I'm learning through my time with you is that having a vineyard is a 12 month a year process and yes. we thought it was just about planting watering caring picking and then but it's yeah. it's really it, year round it is and i think that as the beauty of people you know coming to holyfield is that they can taste something that was grown in their own backyard and learn that you know a quality wine product can be grown in what's considered not considered a right. traditional wine region and people really appreciate that and when they can come here and walk through the gate and see the vineyards they really develop a greater appreciation for the agriculture behind wine because everybody knows it comes from grapes but to see it touch it feel it and as it ripens taste it and then come and pick grapes with us and taste juice of what they just picked. It's an amazing experience for people that really don't have farming or agriculture in their background. So as this program airs, it is, it's the middle of August and that's when you begin harvesting. Yes. And how will people have an opportunity to have that experience? What but should they do? To what they should do is if they want to pick grapes with us, and it really is lots of fun mm -hmm. and it's family friendly and Dad and I have been doing that ever since we started. And the beauty of it is, is we have seen little kids grow up out here picking grapes with oh, us. Nice. And it, that makes it really fun. Um, but th you just call us up and we pick on Sundays and we take you know your reservation it's free reservation sometimes people associate with fees but it's free but we need to know how many people are coming because we pick grapes in the morning and we give instruction and yes. we give everybody pruners to use while they're here and um, then we feed everybody lunch and so a we, nice mm. way to say thank yes. you for a, participating right. in the harvest it's not sandwiches it's yeah. not sandwiches. It's typical. No. It's, it's, it's harvest a food. It's a, harvest. it's a dinner. Yeah. So what is harvest food? Harvest food, like farmers usually eat their big meal during the day, right. not at night. Which is healthier anyway. Right. Yes. <laughs> so we have, you know, brisket or, mm. you know, grilled chicken or, you know. A, it's a dinner. Re it's and, really a dinner. Right. Yeah. And then we always have fresh salsa because Dad and I keep a big tomato garden and mm. we make fresh salsa. That's a big huge hit every weekend. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, we make uh, three gallons at a time. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. going to go hungry. In no, 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 no. <laughs> and so how many weeks does the harvest last? Oh, usually it lasts about roughly eight weeks. So from mid-August? Usually to through the end of September. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we go into the first two weeks in depends. October. It depends yeah. on the season. Right. Yeah. Because right. luckily they don't all get ripe at the same time. We grow a variety of different kinds of grapes. And some ripen earlier and some later. Okay. So, so I think now we are at the point where we are going to go out into the vineyard. We're going to take a look at these wonderful grapes. Some of them are already turning purple. I'm going to actually help prune, which is, you know, astonishing in and of itself. And then we're going to go in the cellar and we're going to see how they make wine.
hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and this week we're not in the kitchen. We are in a vineyard in Baser, Kansas. It's a boutique winery, and it's owned by Les and Michelle Meyer. Thank you both for inviting us to your vineyard. It's in the middle of July, amazingly hot, and the grapes are happy. What are we seeing over here, Michelle? Uh, this is called Verasion, where you're getting actual color on the grapes. And it's an oh, exciting beautiful. time of year because it's the beginning of the ripening season, which means that mm. harvest isn't very far behind. So how much longer, th these are going to turn purple. Yes. How much longer before they're harvested and the winemaking process begins? I would say the, the beginning of our harvest will start with probably white grapes and it'll be in the middle of August, so about a month. Uh, another month. Another month, and then these will probably be, oh, a month and a half. Well, it will probably be about the third week in August. Yeah, third and about week. the third week in August for this. So I know you don't just come out here and plant uh, the vines and throw water on them. I see you all working out here all the time. What is the upkeep that's required? Well, this time of year, vineyards really require year-round management. And it's not <clears throat> something you just put in the ground and then go pick when they're ready. When you first plant a grapevine, it's about three years before you ever pick an actual grape because you want the, all of the growth to go to the roots and the trunk. So the first three years, you actually take the clusters off because you don't want the vine to have the burden of caring for the fruit. You want it to go to the trunk and the root <coughs> strength. And then after three years, you let them usually have a minimal crop. And these vines are probably 10, Older, no, older 12, than that. 13 years 12, 13 years uh -huh. old. And so, but when we pick grapes, all of our grapes are hand harvested. So it needs a certain amount of sun. Yes. And wind. Yes. Uh, and obviously moisture. And so you have to manage the growth of the greenery yes. above it so it gets just the right amount of all of, right. all of nature. This yeah. is constant upkeep and care. Yes. Yes, but this is where wine is made, is out here. So it begins here. Well, let's go look at your canopy work. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is the before and after shot. These vines... We haven't tri We've trimmed them back early in the season, but not recently. So we need to get rid of this canopy that we're looking at. Right. So that the grapes, again, can get the sun and the air that right. they're going to need to ripen properly. Let's see, here's the clusters, and this is a white grape. So what we do when we, we go through here, like dad will work on one side of the row and I'll work on a side of the row. And we just go through and comb it out like this and then trim it back. And you just keep going until you. And how often do you have to work with the canopy? Uh, every day. Every day. <laughs> so this, once you've taken care of the canopy here, then we go then to a different section. And then when, how long will it be before you have to come back to exactly this spot well, and work on the canopy it again? It kind of depends. What we'll, probably what we'll do with this is once we get this all cut back, then we'll come back through uh, closer to the harvest. As they start getting uh, more and more ripe. Yes. And the leaf pull. Okay. So, so you know, down go the vines, and then in a matter of three, four weeks, yeah. you're pulling some leaves sure. just to make sure they continue getting the exposure exactly. to nature that they need. Exactly. But you have to have, you have to have um, a good amount of, you still have to have a good amount of canopy because the grapes some ripen protection. through, yeah. well, and through photosynthesis for the grapes to ripen. What we also do is take this and put it up through here. So that's why when you're driving through California or Italy, it looks as if the greenery is just growing up. Yeah. But when in fact someone it, has, with their own two hands, yes. come through here and cared and for them mm -hmm. just the way you're doing right, right now. Exactly. So once they've been planted, the wires are there to act as their guide. Right. We it, do the trellising when we plant, but then see, all the all that you see, all the green, this is all growth from the season. Because mm -hmm. in the winter time, we're out here every day pruning back the wood. 
see all this? Yeah. So this, after harvest is over, we usually don't like it to get um, cold too quickly. Right. Because this has to harden off and go woody. And then once this is woody, the, all this canopy, then in the winter time from December to April, we're out here every day pruning the can pruning the wood back. This is 24, this is 12 months out of the year. Yes. Regardless yes. of the growing season. It's regardless of the growing season. And you have to do that because you only get fruit on new wood. You don't get fruit on old wood. So you have to cut it back. Which accounts for some of the very ancient vines having yes. the very gnarly yes. base. The vine is just like a person. It's you, your body gives you the energy that you need. Each vine has so much energy and you want it to feed the fruit. This, the fruiting zone's all right here. But oh yeah, I'm, I'm a vintner. See, vintner. <laughs> ah, that's all. Oh, now, yeah. All it took was this and I'm a vintner. There you go, now you, now you got the tool that you need. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the great thing about this we is, don't, we don't show. like, you, you can see your progress. Yes. Well, both here and here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it works out really, really wonderful. So, and then what's really exciting is when they're ripe and you can come and eat them. Yeah. So how many, when you have people picking, how many end up down their throat as compared to in the barrels or the baskets? Or, no, they can't eat that much. They can't eat that much. Well, we used to have, Dad had a friend that said that when he was a child in Europe and he worked for a guy that grew grapes, the guy that they worked for said, that the kids had to be whistling. Whistling, oh, okay. whistling or singing. Uh, that way he knew they weren't eating his grapes. Did you ever see the movie A Walk in the Clouds? Uh-huh. Oh. But we don't, we don't care if people eat them because we feel that when people are picking grapes with us, it gives them a better appreciation, not only of grapes itself, but of the wine. Mm. And it's family friendly and kids can come. So when the kids nice. get to taste it off the vine, they're even more excited. They're even more excited because yeah. they tasted it before it became. Exactly. And then in the cellar, when we're crushing and pressing, then the kids can just take their cup and put it right under the press and taste the juice. Because that's just grape juice just at that point. Just straight grape juice and it's- No alcohol content. No, because no, no. there's no, no fermentation. This is the first time I ever did this, so you have to excuse me. Yeah, we can tell. Okay. Look at all those little grapes that are going to have sun and wind now. Hello, how cute are you? Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and this week in the kitchen, we're actually in a wine cellar. I've been talking to vintners Les and Michelle Meyer. We've chatted about their journey to this profession. We've gone into the vineyard. I actually did some pruning under the direction of these two. And now we're where it happens. We are in the cellar about to make wine. So I know that you said that the greatest amount of care is in caring for the grapes and the vines. And we talked about what you do to make that happen. Right. Now we pick the grapes and we brought them into the cellar. And what do we do from there? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Obviously it's, it is involved. It is. It's a very involved process because when you pick grapes, you pick them at their premium opportunity for quality wine. And- Which means uh, they're really ripe. They're ripe in terms of the sugars are, and the pH and the acids are all in balance. And we've, before we ever decide to pick a grape, Dad and I go through and do random sampling of the berries and decide that we're gonna pick it. And then when you pick a grape, after you pick a grape off the grapevine, it's gonna start to deteriorate. It, Just it, really quick, that happens pretty quickly. Well, you don't, it won't ripen anymore like a peach or a banana. Okay. So once you pick it, it, and the way we do it is we have, you know, what, one weekend we picked 12,000 pounds in at three yeah, hours. We picked 24,000. 24,000 pounds. 12 tons. 12 tons in three hours. Then do you wash? We, no. No, 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 Don't wash. That's a sin. Okay. Okay, so as soon as they are off the vine where they're dumped into lugs, as soon as they're, the trailer's full, it, the trailer's brought down here, and the first thing they go through is a crusher distemmer, and it is a common question about the washing thing. But 
when you talk about vintage and you know years being good versus not so good, yes. typically you'll hear that a vintage is of you know people say that maybe the vintage wasn't quite as good because it rained during harvest season. And see, rain or water, if you were washing grapes, mm -hmm. can penetrate the skin of the grapes and dilute the sugars and the taste. Ah. So you do not wash the grapes before you crush and press them. Okay, so we've learned something and yes. no washing, but you're now ready to press We're them. ready to, well, first they go through what's called a crusher destemmer. Yes. Which is just a big trough. It makes a lot of noise. <laughs> and you dump the, the clusters, you're dumping mm -hmm. clusters into the trough, and it's churning and it's taking the berries off the stems, okay? Mm -hmm. And what you, what you have left is called must, M-U-S-T, like mm -hmm. I worked hard, now I must make wine with the must. Okay. okay, so now we have must. Must, and the must is the seeds, the skin, the pulp, the juice, everything except for the stems, and okay. that's what you make wine with. Okay. Now, depending on if it's a white grape or a red grape determines where it goes next. If it's white, it goes into a press. And when you press, pressing is basically extracting the solids from the juice, mm -hmm. separating them. Mm -hmm. But white grapes typically are not fermented on the skins. So as soon as they're pressed off, we um, really, you know, wine, make, wine cellars, out there it's pretty and beautiful. A wine cellar really is pumps and hoses. <laughs> and me and my dad, you know, did you check this? Did you check that? Turn it off, turn it on, you know. Um, it's not as romantic down here, although it's a lot cooler. Yes, <laughs> it's a little cooler than it was in the vineyard. And I noticed that you have two kinds of barrels here. You've got oak, yes. which you say you use for your red. Right. And your white is in stainless steel. And yes. why have you made that decision for your whites? But it was a style decision. Um, at Holyfield, we only barrel aged red wines. We don't, and we don't barrel ferment or barrel aged white wine, just because we prefer to have a more fruit forward, crisp, white style okay. wine. So we just don't barrel ferment or barrel aged whites. That's just a style thing. Your your decision. Yeah. So you press them. You've got the white grape juice, and that's what you make your wine. We make our wine with the clear juice. The clear juice. And then we put it into another refrigerated tank and then we pitch the yeast. So the yeast is a process that does the fermentation. Yes. So when you have yeast, the yeast job is to, the sugar is in the grapes. There's, you know, the... So when you're making dough, sometimes people add sugar to activate the yeast, but right. you have your sugar already right, on the in grape. the berry. Mm -hmm. So, and that, and you need the sugar because you, for the alcohol. So the yeast job is to eat the sugar, and as it eats the sugar, it's creating alcohol and CO2. And then sometimes winemakers intervene and choose to kill the yeast and make a wine with natural residual sweetness. Mm -hmm. But if you let the yeast finish eating, then you have dry wine. And so your wines tend to be... Well, we do both You styles. do both? So if we're, if we're making red wine, those are going into the oak, into the oak into barrels. Into these oak mm -hmm. barrels. And Correct. so the process is... The process with red is when you pick it and then you crush. Um, you, and after you've crushed, the must consists of solids and juice. Yes. Okay. So and seeds. And so seeds. solids include the seeds and the skins and everything except for the stems. So the must, instead of going into a press, it goes into what we call an open top fermenter, which is just a big tank. So all of those things contribute to the flavor of red. The seeds and the skin yes. are part of what makes this red. Right because that's where you get your color extraction and, and your tannins, and your tannins. Which is what a lot of people love about red wines are the tannins with the health benefits and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. The solids form what's called a cap or crust on the top and the juice, but the fermentation is taking place in here, is on the bottom. So you can have a, a pretty dense cap so about three times a day you punch it down. It's called punching down the cap. It's, and um, you just take a big mallet. This is physical work. Yeah. 
Making wine is physical work. You just, I don't know, the illusion, or maybe it's only mine, because you pour it into a barrel and you put some stuff in it, and you keep checking it, and, but you all are. That, that's what a lot of people think. All right, so this is what is used to punch down yeah. the, cap. the cap on the red wine before you press it. Right. Yeah, it's usually pressed this down. This is a beautiful red. At, at least uh, twice a day and sometimes three times a day. Do both of you do this? Oh yes. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. We take turns. Okay. I'm on one side of the tank, he's on the other. I punch, then I toss it to him, he punches, he punches. and we go back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now we But then when you press it, yes. what we do is because it's not in a hose or anything like it is with white wine, so we just take six gallon pails and pail it out into the press. And then Sometimes the tank gets so low you can't reach, so then you just hop in with it and do it that way. So yeah, so you're one with the wine. You're one with the wine. <laughs> you are very intimately connected <laughs> with your wine. We usually put it in the barrels in December or January. So this is a, a harvest that may have happened in September, October. Correct. And yes. then it gets to the old barrels by December or January. December or January, mm -hmm. and then it's going to stay there for a year. At least. At, at mm -hmm. least. Yeah. Well, the, the, the key to oak aging is you don't want the oak to be the overwhelming characteristic of the wine. You want it to integrate with the actual fruit of the wine. Mm -hmm. So that it's, you know, multi-dimensional. It's not mm -hmm. just one-dimensional. Real oak. Okay. And oak it is there to enhance, but it's not there to be the main characteristic. That's not your goal. No. Right. Mm -hmm. You want, you know, a well-rounded wine. Like you want, you know, a lot of things in your life to be well-rounded. Your wine should be Your too. wine should be too. <laughs> okay. So we've had a chat with the vintners, we've been in the vineyard, we've been down to the wine cellar, and now it is time to taste the fruits of our labor. Les, Michelle, we have three of your international award-winning, and I know there have been others, wines. And let's talk about what we're drinking and um, what we're tasting. Okay. So what did, what did you pour first, Les? Uh, we poured Saval. Saval, and, and tell us what, it's, tell us what, it's obviously white wine. White wine. And, and what are we going to be tasting here? Well, um, all I think I can say it, it's good. I, well, the good part, yes, and obviously many other people think so too, thus the award, but what are, you, uh, what, what are the flavors? Well, the, I, I, to me, it's a nice, light, uh, medium body crisp wine. There's no oak on this, so you're not going to get uh, any no vanilla or right. anything like that. It's fruit forward, and to me, it has a lot of like bright, uh, bright green apple. Mm. It's nice and crisp. What's well, perfect summer wine? What would you anything special you'd serve with? Obviously, very refreshing and perfect for this time I think of year. Something like this would pair well with like um, tilapia. Tilapia, it'd be great with, with, yeah. with tilapia with lemon on it. Mm. Okay, well, does well with lemon and uh -huh. citrus. Yes, excellent that way. Okay, absolutely. What kind of cheese might you pair this with? I probably not anything too heavy. Something lighter, a lighter uh, white cheese, not a okay. not a like cheddar. a goat's cheese. It goes or? really good with uh, goat cheese. In fact. We have goat cheese here from Goat's Beard Farm, mm -hmm. and they do a marinade with olive oil oh. and um, tomato, and it does go really well with that. more acid mm -hmm. there. Oh, great. Now, what's the next wine that we're going to taste? Okay, we're going to taste the St. Vincent, which is a... Another award winner uh, for oh, you. Yes. This is a... This is a wine that is light-bodied. Yes. More of a Pinot type um, style. Grape. More Pinot, not heavy like cab. No. Or, no. no. So uh, obviously another good summer wine yes, exactly. as well. Great with uh, grilled salmon. or smoked salmon. Mm. 
It has a real bright mm. uh, cherry character. It's mm. real forward. So good with grilled meats. Mm -hmm. Especially like salmon and pork tenderloin and things like that. And you know, we, we just did a uh, pork chop, a uh, heritage pork chop at uh, Room 39. Oh, uh -huh. And they paired with a Pinot Noir. Yeah. So I bet this would yes. go great with their pork it chops. Certainly would. What cheese might you want to pair this with? Oh, I think a, like a, if you had a fruit encrusted brie. Oh, that's that would yummy. be great anyway, but this would be good with the fruit encrusted yeah, brie. Yeah, I think so. Oh, because no, this wonderful. has a lot of really vibrant cherry character up front. Okay. So I think that would be good. Mm. As we say, Lachaim to life, I think we should. Oh. Absolutely. To life. To life. So now the third wine, another international award winning, the Cynthiana. And yes. what kind of grape did you say? This is actually a Native American grape as opposed to a French hybrid like the others we've been tasting. Okay. And this grape is also commonly known by the name Norton. Norton. Norton okay. and Cynthiana are the same grape. And so if you encounter it, yes. Midwest, um, you know, in the Midwest, it regional wineries. Some people call it Norton, and some people call it Cynthia. But, but it, it won the same awards. Race. Yes, yeah. it just won a gold medal at uh, San Diego. And how would what would you pair this with? Now, to me, this is a lot heavier bodied and a yes. lot more acidic. So it would pair well with a heavier red meat, especially like a prime rib that has some, or lamb where there's a lot of more fat and marbling because the acidity in the wine helps act as kind of a palate cleanser. It really balances out your meal. And then would this be one that you would pair with blue cheese? Since it Les could likes very well blue go cheese. well with blue cheese. So at last we have found a wine for Les's <laughs> blue cheese. That's true. All right, now we hear a lot of things about the correct temperature to serve wine. And what would you recommend for your reds and for your whites? Well, for white wine, typically, people typically recommend uh, 52 to 55 degrees. And however, if you like it colder than that, you can have it that way. If How about you that? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, my feeling about it is, is there are guidelines, and you can choose those guidelines, or it since it's your enjoyment you should have it the way you like so you make that decision for yourself but right. generally yes. white wine is sort of chilled yes and between 52 and 55 I'd so say is a good temperature the refrigerator is 40 if it comes yeah. out of there for let it warm up just right. a little bit mm -hmm. now your red wines I've heard both between room temperature and 60 degrees and is that just and another I usually say 58 Oh, so you serve them a little colder. Well, yeah. you know, a lot of people don't understand the concept of room temperature. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. room temperature can actually be rather warm. It can. And that Especially comes... Especially day like today. It comes from the time when people actually stored their wine in a cellar, which was cooler. Uh -huh. And so, really, it's more cellar temperature, okay. which for reds is typically about 58. Um, and so if you see somebody popping a red in the fridge, that's perfectly fine because they want it to be, you know, a little bit cooler. A little bit cooler. Mm -hmm. okay. Especially rosé. Especially rosé. Yeah, rosé I would treat like a white wine actually probably okay. and chill it a little bit more. Okay. Well, but we want to thank you for inviting us to your vineyard. You're welcome. And uh, sharing your passion and your excellent wines with us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, thank you for coming by. Enjoyed having you.